still calls itself Labour, and the Liberal Democrats spent so long trying to reverse the Brexit vote that it's difficult to see how they could ever again be considered Liberal or Democratic. The Greens don't seem to prioritise green issues anymore, preferring to bang on at every opportunity about the new religion of gender identity, and members of the monster raving loony party aren't actually insane. They just wear silly hats. So nobody's being honest here. After this week's local elections, it might be worth considering the current state of the Labour Party. Do we even have an effective opposition anymore? The party has made some significant gains in London, but not where it really needs to, in the north and in the industrial heartlands that it lost to the Tories in the last general election. After Partygate, plenty of Conservative voters were rightly furious that they'd had their liberties restricted when those who set the rules didn't think they applied to themselves. But now we have Beergate and the revelations that Keir Starmer and his crew ordered curry and drank beer. Perhaps next there's going to be a similar scandal with the Lib Dems, probably involving low-calorie shandies and vegan quiche. We'll have to wait and see. Many people have described Keir Starmer as wooden, perhaps because he only has one facial expression and doesn't have a pulse. But it turns out that this is the very quality that might just save him. People just don't see him as rebellious enough to break the rules deliberately. So, of course, it wasn't a party. Any room with Keir Starmer in it, by definition, cannot be a party. <laughs> and maybe the beer is really important to maintain the cognitive dissonance required to be in a party called Labour and yet be irredeemably middle class. Maybe if Labour MPs sobered up, they might, might start saying that they know what a woman is. And we couldn't have that. The culture wars have made the distinctions between right and left all but irrelevant. The Tories claim to be fighting a war on woke, and yet they're pushing through their online safety bill, which not only represents a serious threat to free speech, but even uses the language of the woke by reframing words as being harmful. As for Labour, it has become completely infected with the bourgeois virus of identity politics. And the rot set in a long time ago. Do you remember when Harriet Harman was trundling around the country in the run-up to the 2015 election in her pink battle van in the hope of enticing female voters? Because women, as we all know, are not swayed by political argument or debate, but by bright colours moving very quickly. <laughs> and if you think that's patronising, do you remember this from Jeremy Corbyn? Only Labour can be trusted to unlock the talent of black, Asian and minority ethnic people. Just imagine all that Ella Fitzgerald, James Baldwin and Martin Luther King might have achieved if only Corbyn had been around to unlock their full potential. Corbyn, you'll remember, he charged white party members an extra £10 a head to hear him speak at an event in Loughborough. He also announced his pronouns before the 2017 election. Hey, I'm Jeremy Corbyn, leader of the Labour Party. My pronouns are he, him. And weirdly, this didn't translate to electoral success. Perhaps because voters who are struggling to make ends meet generally aren't interested in old men with beards going out of their way to inform them that they are male. Of course, that's not what Corbyn was doing at all. He was simply making a shallow declaration of fealty to this bourgeois religion of group identity. It's the same reason why Dawn Butler claims that babies are born without a biological sex and why the Labour-run Camden Council spent over £10,000 on road crossings painted in the trans colours, even though they were facing a £20 million budget shortfall due to the pandemic. The woke movement, in other words, is not left-wing in any meaningful sense. To be left-wing, you have to be concerned, first and foremost, with class politics and economic inequality, not with pronouns and garish rainbow flags and other middle-class obsessions. Poverty is not an identity, but a reality of those for whom the machinery of living has broken down. And this is why social justice activists are usually from posh backgrounds, because if you've never had to struggle for money, it doesn't feel like a priority. The rise of the woke movement and the success of their culture war has effectively sabotaged the class struggle of the traditional left. Identity politics is not progressive. It's a bourgeois fig leaf that often conceals the realities of economic inequality. It's much easier and cheaper for companies to hire diversity experts than to ensure that their staff have increased pay and better working conditions. The woke ideology has never caught on in poorer communities, and it never will, because those who are facing authentic hardship have little patience for the exaggerated, manufactured or imagined grievances of the privileged. And the sooner that Keir Starmer and the Labour Party figure this out, the sooner they'll have a shot at getting back into power. My studio guests this evening are comedians Leo Kurse and Stephen Grant. 
OK, I'm going to go straight into the audience for some questions here. We've got our first question here from Edward. Edward. Hi. Um, is it arrogant when England fans sing football's coming home? Is it arrogant when England fans sing football's coming home? I'm not a football fan, by the way. I don't know anything about football, but my two panellists do. This, by the way, is a reference to the report that the FA, uh, which I think means Football Association, you see, I know something, uh, they're not going to have three Lions as the England team's official anthem at this year's World Cup. Uh, uh, they said it would it would perceive it would, could be perceived to be arrogant by other countries. Do you think that's right, Leo? I mean, it could certainly be perceived as overly hopeful by other countries. <laughs> but I think arrogant. Why? Who cares if it's arrogant? It's football. You're supposed to. Who, like, who, what football fans are being like? Oh no, you seem arrogant. It's like football <laughs> chants are supposed to strike fear into the hearts of the other team. And, Is that uh, what they're for? It over. I have no idea. I'm not. Uh, I, I don't support sports that Scotland's bad at. But, uh, but yeah, I, I curling. Think, I think it's. Sorry, I think I think it's. I think it's, I think it's ridiculous. Are we going to also ban like you'll never walk alone because it's ableist? And uh, are we going to change glory, glory, Man United to equity, equity, Man United? Oh, in fact, you can't even say man. It would be equity, equity, person, United. So I think that works. It's ridiculous. What do you think, Stephen? Are you a football fan? I am a football fan, mm. actually. Yeah, in a, in a big way. And actually, the irony of football's coming home is, is that when you look at you know, it's context, isn't it? If you look at all of the lyric, it's actually about the fact that we're hopeful but doomed to fail. Is that what it's the, about? Yeah, football's coming home. It's, it's always about this idea that we've got this belief that there's a chance, but we will ultimately fail. And even David Baddiel went on the record and saying, actually, it's about hope in the face of likely failure. Okay, um, and the problem is, though, if you just have the chorus, it's coming home, it's coming home, football's coming home, it does sound a little bit like, we own this. But yeah. you've got to remember that there's an inherent arrogance in the FA, and that is the name. The Football Association. <laughs> the Scottish Football Association is the SFA, the Scottish Football Association. In fact, all international football associations are the name of the country with FA in it. But for England, it's just the Football Association, because when we set it up, we were the only one. Uh. It's the same way as in America, while everything is .com and not .co.us. Right? If you're the first, you get to own it. So England, the FA, in other words, is the, the centre of this. It's inherently arrogant. It's arrogant. Otherwise, it oh, would well, be the English FA. The rest of the world calls it the English FA. We call it the FA. See, is this just projection, then? On their part? I mean, it does seem strange to sort of cancel a song in this way. I mean, my problem with the singing at football matches is they never... They don't harmonise very well. <laughs> but, you, know, they, they, it, it, you, it, you need rugby. Is that, oh, okay, because yeah. they went to posher schools. And, yeah, yeah. And they were all yeah, in choir or, clubs. or they're in the uh, sort of Welsh mining choir. <laughs> yeah, the rugby, the rugby has a higher standard of singing, that has mm. to be said. I, I, think, I think the key thing is, I don't know if anybody watched the, the Euros final between Italy and England, and obviously Italy won it, and one of the Italian players grabbed the camera and said, it's, swear, insert swear word here, in perfect English, obviously, well done, Italy, uh, it's coming home to Italy, like that, right? right. There, as in, screw you, we, we've won. And I think the FA just wants to avoid that to be a kind of a regular thing that every opposing team says when they beat Fair England enough. for the next 20 years. Yeah, well, exactly. But it is a very popular song, isn't it? I mean, it's a very, I mean people really love yeah. it. And it always does really well every time there's a, a, another a game on. Yeah, um, and, and there have been worse things chanted at football <laughs> They have, most definitely. So, you know, I think people can, can relax a bit. And, uh, and yeah, like, um, I, I think, yeah, bring it, like, banning something like this. Like, there's already an element in football that's upset about the, the forcing of woke politics. Yeah. Onto the football pitch with uh, you know people taking the knee, which is still happening. Two years on, uh, football players are, are still kneeling, uh, which you know previously politics wasn't allowed to be um, you know uh, expressed in, in in football as much. So I think for this you know to ban such a such a popular song, but they're not changing. Just going to aggravate they're not things. worried about the three lines. They're not worried about this being jingoistic or anyway or nationalistic or anything like that. It's about the idea of arrogance, and that's an interesting approach because I think at one point they did change one of the three lines to a woman lion. Lioness, as they are known. Right. Is that, is the Lionesses are the, are the, the women's the, England team. Oh, that, oh is that right? Are the, okay. are the Lionesses, yes. Yeah. So oh, okay. there's a trans lion on the shirt now. Um, I'll have to check. I'll get, definitely I'll, 2022. I will get back to you on that one. I'm not familiar with the trans lion, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. Let's go to another question now. This from Susan. Hello, hi, Andrew. Susan. Hi. It, hi. Is there such a thing as black privilege? Black privilege. OK, so this is to do with Simon Isherwood. Simon Isherwood, he was sacked from his job as a conductor for West uh, Midlands Trains for his comments, and this was following an online diversity training course. And after the session ended, Isherwood... And, and you know what happens. You don't know your mic's still on. And he was heard asking his wife if they have black privilege in other countries, such as Ghana. He was basically suggesting that... Uh, white privilege is uh, questionable, I suppose. And then he was sacked for gross misconduct, but now he's suing West Midlands Train. So this is interesting, isn't it, Stephen? Yeah. Do you think, do you think this is, he's got a case? I, I, do you know what? I think uh, I, I looked into this, and actually he, 
he was on a... He might have been a conference call, a Zoom call or something yes. like that, and he, and he left his microphone on. And I think if, if we all... He's 60... And yeah. he left a Zoom mic on. And I think we can accept that's going to happen. Yeah, of course that's I mean, happen, yeah. I spent a year and a half doing online gigs over Zoom and the amount of people I heard hoovering and swearing at their dog was <laughs> off the stand. Right? That is not something I got used to in the world of heckling when I was doing comedy clubs. And um, I think there has to be a certain leniency that for anything anyone says to their partner... I think you can be the, the most liberally minded, accepting, open minded human being in the world, but what you say to your other half in the comfort of your own home, I think it should almost have some kind of American style kind of Fifth Amendment that says that is completely akin. You cannot have any kind of comeback from what well, no, that's true. In that we, we do have that. So, uh, the SNP don't have that because they introduced their hate crime bill that said you could be prosecuted for things you say in your own home. But right. in England, we do have that. You yeah. can't prosecute someone for something. Like that. But this was transmitted. That's the point, isn't it? It was broadcast. This was broadcast effectively. Yeah. So, yeah, but again, I mean, that raises issues of privacy and consent. So, I mean, uh, I assume there's some sort of automatic opt-in consent to having the, the meeting recorded and having it broadcast to, to everyone. Yeah. Uh, but was that made explicitly clear to him? Was he was well, he read the terms and conditions of that? Probably not. And as for, you know, bringing the company into disre disrepute, he said it on a, on a private internal uh, Zoom call. So uh, the only way it could bring the company into disrepute is if it was broadcast outside the company. But there's another step to this, isn't there? Is the opinion that he expressed even disreputable? As in, no. as in the idea of him saying that, that a lot of people challenge the notion of white privilege. Well, and this is this is this is the other thing. I mean, in, in training, you're supposed to raise questions. If somebody says, if somebody raises some, brings something up, you know, for, purely for the sake of understanding it properly yourself, you're supposed to question and uh, and raise raise issues. If everybody's got to sit in their hands and just accept the mantras that are handed down to them and just repeat them as yeah. rote learning without any understanding, then what use is, what use is the mantra? I mean, that, what do you think, Stuart? I mean, th this question of... Because I get what people mean when they talk about white privilege. They're talking yeah. about how, in a majority white country, you're not going to experience racism, which is almost certainly true in most cases. Um, but the problem with the phrase is it does kind of generate a lot of resentment from poor, underprivileged white people who are like, well, I'm not privileged, you know what I mean? It's not a good phrase to kind of encapsulate... Statistically, in this country, the, the, the concept of white privilege would be most upsetting to the vast majority of working-class white people who don't have privilege. Yes, that's my point. By virtue of the, 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 the demographics within this country. Yeah. And yeah. I, think, I think if that was the question he was asking, then he would, might have had a point, but I don't think he quite phrased and worded it. Well, no, because he said, do they have black privilege in Ghana? Do they have black privilege in Ghana? I think that was, that was the fundamental tenet of the question, what he was on, but it wasn't how he went. But you can see it. what he's trying to get at there. And also, uh, it's a valid question. Do they have black privilege in Ghana, where I think uh, the country's 2% white? Is that, is that it's, correct? Yeah, it's 2% white, 98% black. Yeah, so right. is there, is there a privilege amongst black people there? It would be interesting to know. I mean, it genuinely would be interesting to know if there is or if there are other... Uh, you know, post-colonial paradigms that, that mean that there isn't uh, yeah. black privilege. But it, that's what I mean. It doesn't strike me as a racist question. Yeah. It strikes me as quite an interesting question, potentially. Yeah. But they fired him straight away. And that seems to be the knee-jerk reaction, doesn't it? Straight I, away, let's well, just they, fire him. They fired him for bringing West Midland trains into disrepute. <laughs> Regardless of what your view is on white privilege, if you've ever been on a West Midlands train, it is not the view on white and black privilege that brings that train company into disrepute. No. <laughs> it's its inability to be able to not be replaced by a bus at the weekend. Yeah. So, I mean... It's that, it's the sticky seats, you know, it's the... it's the uh, They're always after, late. After you've been on. No. What, the, what on earth <laughs> are you implying? It's a family show. But it's almost as if... It's almost as if... The the company, West Midlands Trains, would be better off investing the money in the train services rather than providing this yeah. training around uh, sort of elitist uh, morality and, uh, and, 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 and also um, firing staff. No, I think it's important. I need to know. If someone's collecting my ticket, I need to know that they're thinking the correct way <laughs> about a variety of cultural issues. <laughs> That's what I need to know. It's really important, I think. Look, we need to get another question now from Rory. Where is Rory? Hello. Uh, is Sir Keir Starmer guilty of double standards? OK, so I've been talking about this already in this show. Obviously, is Sir Keir Starmer guilty of double standards? Of course, this is about beer gate, and um, I believe now the police are now reopening that investigation. Uh, we also have the photos. He's, he's got a beer in hand. Uh, they've got... They're eating chicken korma. Uh, I believe it was chicken korma. Wow. Uh, yeah, I know. 
That says, see, for me, that, that is what disconnects him from the working classes. Right? <laughs> and if you want to reach out and say you've had a beer and a curry, there's going to be a lot of people out there. And I think in Keir Starmer's defence, there's no element... There's no-one's actually said that he's lied. And I think that's an no. issue with, 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 but, with Boris, that he lied and said he didn't, but he's been found that he did. But we but, know that Boris lies. We know that he... That's, that's one, that doesn't that's, make it OK. It's charming. That he it's charming it's that he does charming it. It's not charming that he lies. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you were, the, you were the best. You scamp. You know, exactly. I mean, it's, it's the, the kind of... The channel of lies is not what he you expecting from a Prime Minister? I feel that Keir Starmer is certainly more honest. I think the issue is that, that you know, that double standard thing is going to be difficult for them to reverse out of. But you had... If you're going to bend the laws of lockdown for a curry, why a caller? Yeah. So I that, mean, like, yeah. of all the breaths... I mean, at the one time you're going to join together with your colleagues, probably for a, a, a well-deserved curry. And, and I think even Leo, who might feel that there's double standards this, will say, come on, you're working together, have a beer and a curry, that's acceptable. But could you hit a Joe Frazee at yeah, the exactly. least? Yeah, Joe Frazee. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> come on, just, you know what, you know, get home at the end of the day, what you do last night? Do you know what? I absolutely pushed the bow last night. I know you're not supposed to do it. Had a beer with a few of the mates and... Got in a korma. Oh, you legend! I mean, that's the thing. Oh, you're right. A korma is too anodyne and bland. It doesn't do much for his image. He I, needs, I, something, I, he needs I, something. I would have lied about that. I would have said it was it was a vindaloo. I had a file on the side, yeah. and then they shot chilies in my eyeballs, and that's, that's what it did. So. <laughs> do you think that's right? Liam? I, I actually think a korma is too spicy for Keir Starmer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's probably right. But do you think there is a case to be made here, insofar as the hypocrisy element? That was what the question was about from Rory. There is that because you know. It wasn't just that he was calling for Boris Johnson to resign, yeah. which he was. He also said that Rishi Sunak should resign. And from what I understand it, Rishi Sunak just sort of stumbled into the room on his way <laughs> to a meeting. He was like, oh, there's a cake, I better get out. Yeah. As far as I, what, from what, that was my understanding of it, He's anyway. You've seen cartoons where the cake explodes. And he, he got out of there quick. Yeah, yeah I did the same. R but apparently, Rishi was being diligent and turned up for the meeting 10 minutes early, walked into what he thought was going to be an empty room <laughs> for his meeting, and basically stumbled into a right. party. But right. then Keir still said that he should resign for that. He should resign for just accidentally. That. Because, now, now, because he lied and but said, Keir did he did lie. said he wasn't there. Keir when did, did lie. Keir, when he did he lie? He certainly lied by omission, so he said people weren't at the party, or he didn't. He denied that people were at the party, who then turned out to be at the party. His new details, as, as the video was uh, was discovered. Well, they're saying uh, that Rainer also, was there now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he also he also said uh, that it wasn't pre-planned, and there's now documents uh, showing that it was pre-planned. But we so should we should say we don't have the you know the police. If they're going to investigate, they're going to investigate. We don't know for sure. Oh, and that's another we thing. The police uh, announced the investigation after the election. After the polls had closed, like literally the moment the polls closed, Durham police announced they were, they that were going to That sounds conspiratorial to me. Which is conspiratorial. Yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, obviously, I don't want Durham police to sue me, but it was definitely conspiratorial. And uh, <laughs> I, think there are, there are, I think there are rules about about putting politicians in the news in the run-up to election. Yes, there There's are. certain things you can and can't That's do. That's true. You can't reveal uh, possible yeah. crimes they might have done. No, you can start <laughs> investigating it, but you can't reveal the fact that you're doing the investigation. The trouble is, I feel that a lot of this will be weaponised, as Leo is doing right now, yeah. I, you know, because you don't like, <laughs> like Labour, right? So you can imagine if it was Nicola Sturgeon with a curry, you'd be going all out. You hate it. Oh, her, yeah, yeah. You? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that would be my worry about the Hypocrisy... I don't know. I yeah. don't know. Maybe. Well, yes, the piousness that he, he was continually trying to nail Boris and Rishi and anybody else to the but wall. On or... the other hand, wait a minute, Lou. If you're having a, a, a full day's work and they're on the campaign trail and it's the evening and they're still working, you've got to eat. Yeah. So why is that such a big deal? Tesco meal deal. What's wrong with Tesco? So now you want to militate about what they should eat? Absolutely. So, why is he? Why is he like dialing out? Why is he getting just eat? So some poor kids got to get on a get on a moped, travel across town, possibly spreading coronavirus as he goes. Because let's not forget how tenuous. dangerous coronavirus was. This is apparently. so tenuous, so, Leo. I'm yeah. going to move on. <laughs> I'm going to move on to Mary. We've got a question from Mary. Where's Mary? I'm here. Hello. Hello. Should Oxbridge offer places to fewer students from private schools? Should Oxbridge offer places to fewer students from private schools? And this is very interesting because uh, this, this comes after Professor Stephen Toop, who's the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge, said top universities should reduce the number of people from independent school backgrounds. Now, the number of state school children going to Cambridge has gone up uh, from 68.7% in 2019 to 72% last year. So that's still going up, which has been acknowledged as being progress. But only still around 7% of children are educated at private schools. Now, I find this interesting because I used to teach at a private school. I was actually the Oxbridge coordinator 
at this private school. <laughs> so my job was to manipulate the system as much as possible to get the posh kids who paid a lot of money into their rightful places <laughs> at Oxford and Cambridge. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, so I kind of get what's going on here. It's, you know, if you go to a posh school, you've got all this money, you get extra tuition, all of this stuff. You've got people strategizing about the best way you can get in, which colleges are you most likely to get into if you apply to. I had to draw up graphs and everything saying, you know, basically if you apply at that college, you're a shoe in. Right, so really corrupt. And the thing about that is, um, <laughs> it does mean that state school kids are at a disadvantage. State school kids, even if they're as smart as some of the posture kids, are going to get lesser, lower grades, right? So isn't this a good thing, Leo? Uh, no, I mean, I, th I think it should... I think whenever quotas come in, rigid set quotas that have to be filled, I, yep. think, I think it damages the system. And it also uh, diminishes the achievements of the, the kids who get there under their own steam because, uh, you know, it could be working class kids who've been to state school uh, and they get in and people are just like, oh, well, you just got there because there's quota scheme. Well, that, that's so, a risk. Yes, that is a risk. Yeah, so that's, that's a risk. And also, on the other hand, what's, what's the point of getting rich? Uh, if you can't then use that money to give your kid a better start in life. What's the, what's <laughs> okay. the point? Why, the, the whole economic system's going to collapse if we can't have vile monetary nepotism driving us. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's interesting. Stephen, do you, do you think that Leo's got a point there? Well, I th first and foremost, I'd like to say that whatever myself and Leo say now is an opinion, because we are kind of like effectively have an expert on the panel, bearing in mind this is literally what you did for a living. It is, yeah. But the reality of it is it's quite the opposite of a quota. This is actually talking about a meritocracy. The whole point is that there has always been a de facto quota in Oxbridge entrance, and that has been that if you are from a public school, there's effectively a backdoor quota that you will get in on a above a state school child who might be better qualified and more intelligent. And the reality of it is, is that if you've walked into a public school recently, and I'm sure you'll back me up on this, this idea that it is the future captains of industry and they're the children of admirals and industry leaders, they're not. It's all new money. These are, these are, these are builders and Bitcoin investors, and they're thick. <laughs> and, they, if you to think, and to think that their children are somehow well, intellectually superior because their parents are rich is, is a, is, it was not the case Look, 30 years ago I anymore. Would, I... And these kids going in, trust me, Oxbridge want more uh, bright state school kids in there. Of course they do, yeah. Because their numbers are dropping down and their pathway. You know, the reality of it is, th this is most, the people who are most unfairly, unlike, uh, unfairly going to be impacted by this are the state school children who get into public school through scholarships, who yep. now have less yeah. of a chance of getting into university because they're at a public school and they got there in the first place because they were bright. That is a very good point. That is a very good point. And I do think it is, it is tricky in a way because you do, like you say, it should be a meritocracy. What Oxford and Cambridge really, really want is the very smart kids getting in. That's what they want. Mm. But they've never quite uh, nailed that. It's never quite worked. It's actually harder now with grade inflation, I would say, as well, because um, a lot of mediocre students get A's now. Right. They just do, because, the, because each successive government has wanted to be able to say, we're the ones who are improving education. So they make it slightly easier to get the higher grades, so they have better results. And the result of that is, if you are an outstanding candidate, it's difficult to distinguish you from a mediocre candidate. That, I think, is where we need to address it. Maybe that's the way. Yeah, or, or possibly uh, look at making other universities better, and maybe making university not the you know, apparent necessity for, for a productive life. Sure. I mean, I think, uh, I think we're focusing far too much on sending kids to, to university when uh, I think getting an apprenticeship can be much better for you than uh, learning about gender studies for four years. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, an apprenticeship, you know, you, uh, people who do apprentices often earn a lot more money than people who go to university. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a specific kind of thing being, going into the academic world. Not, that's not for everyone, and yeah. that's not snobbish. That's, that's actually no. That's it's, not... You will get. You'll find children that went to school together, and one of them went on to an apprenticeship uh, for plumbing, and the other one went and did a postgraduate certificate in education on top of a master's about international studies. And then they meet up for a drink afterwards, and the one who's plumbing is buying all the drinks. Of course, because the person who has spent the last eleven years getting first-class results in education is broke. Yeah, this is absolutely true. And there's been a lot of academics who've left academia to retrain as plumbers because plum plumbers earn a fortune. Yeah. You know, they rip you off. It's very, really it's very hard in the <laughs> lecturing world to get cash in hand. Yeah, really is. <laughs> anyway, after the break on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be joined by Helen Joyce, author of the Sunday Times bestseller, Trans When Ideology Meets Reality. See you in two minutes.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. Even by current standards, it's been a very busy week in the media for people involved in the ongoing debate about sex and gender. A book that tells children that a person's sex is assigned to them at birth by a doctor has been sent to more than 800 primary schools across the UK. SNP NP Joanna Cherry has challenged Nicola Sturgeon to a public debate on the Gender Recognition Act after Scotland's First Minister failed to define what a woman is. And a lesbian lawyer who has accused Stonewall of trying to have her sacked over her views on trans women accused the charity's barrister, barrister of bullying her and laughing at her during her employment tribunal. So joining me now, I have Helen Joyce, the author of Trans, When Ideology Meets Reality. It was a Times Spectator and Observer Book of the Year in 2021 and is now, this week, out in paperback. Helen Joyce, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me on. Now, Helen... Uh, this, you, congratulations on the uh, ongoing success of this brilliant book. And um, you might want to give us some background on to why you wrote the book, because this wasn't the sex gender area. That wasn't your area, was it, particularly when no, you wrote no. it? No, um, no. When I came across this area, I was the finance editor of The Economist. So I was running pieces about bond markets and oil prices and such like. <laughs> uh, no, I just stumbled across the fact that there were people saying that what made you a man or a woman was what you felt like rather than just, you know... Yes. Look down and have a quick check, if you don't know. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't believe that. It took me about a year to try to work through the implications. And it was when I realised that in the name of this idea, uh, children were being put on a path to transitioning. And in case anyone doesn't know, that can lead you to sterility. So they put children on the path to puberty blockers, then cross-sex hormones and then operations. And I went to an event where I met some girls between 18 and 21, uh, some of whom had already had um, hysterectomies at that point, and then realised it was all a terrible mistake. And yes. they were lesbian or they were autistic spectrum disorder or, you know, they had had childhood abuse or this was the latest social fad. And here they were with the rest of their lives ahead of them. And this is what had happened. Can you give us a sense of the extent of the problem? Because I know when, when clinics such as the Tavistock Clinic, which is the NHS uh, paediatric gender clinic, Clinic was set up. They were they had very few referrals in the early days. That's right. But then yeah. now it's grown exponentially. And they're just the tip of the iceberg. They see a few thousand kids a year, but actually, if you go into any um, classroom in a, you know a big city or somewhere like London or Cambridge or Brighton or somewhere like that, in every classroom there'll be a kid who's trans identified. They may not be talking about it to their parents. They may not be talking about it to their teachers, but they will be talking about it among themselves. And if it doesn't go any further than that, you think, oh well, it's just the latest thing about being like a goth, isn't it? Yes. But, you know, for some of them, it does go further. And for all of them, you know, to me, it's a massively sexist idea, this idea that what makes you a man or a woman is something other than just what you are. Like, I just am a woman. 
there's nothing I could do to not be a woman. You know, yes. I can go and get a PhD in mathematics as I did. I'm still a woman. Yes. You know, you're a gay man. That doesn't make you not a man. Yes. So it's massively sexist and actually homophobic as well to think that there's any sort of behaviour standard to being male or female. Uh, this, this is something that you really point out in your book, which I should hold up. Actually, oh, yes. I, think it's I very let you hold it up. There, there we go. This is Trans When Ideology Meets Reality. And it is a superb book. And I think what you do really well is you sort of, a very, in a very accessible way, talk people through the issues. Because I think a lot of people, when we talk about these issues, think it's a very simple matter of uh, equal rights for trans people which you are, of course, for equal rights yes, yeah, for yeah, trans I mean, people. Yeah, I mean, for equal rights for everybody. Yes. I'm just not for people being able to force other people to say they are what they aren't. Yes. And it sounds like it's kind, but actually I'm really not sure what's kind about saying that a male person can compete as a woman in sport. Like, that's not very kind to all the women in the sport, is it? You know, there's already a competition for the male person to compete in, and we're seeing that all the time. So at the heart, what it's about is there is a, a contingent of people, and not all trans people, I should say, who believe that we each have a, an innate gender identity. And you describe it in the book as something like a sexed soul, which yeah. I think is a really neat way of sort of uh, uh, describing that. What they that. say is that that overrides your body. Yes. Well, fine if you want to feel like that. I don't. Yes. And I don't want kids told it either. So actually I was quoted in, in, in articles about that book that you mentioned, the one that's gone out to 800 primary schools. And what I said to the journalist, and he put it in in full, I was so pleased. You know, I said, um, they talk about sex assigned at birth. Like, I don't know, you know, who's assigning this sex at birth? I've had kids twice. And yes. both times, 20 weeks, I knew what sex the child was. Like, they yes. don't come out, you know, and have somebody go, mm, you know, sorting hat, let's see, is this a boy or a girl? Like, you know what your child is. Yes. And then to go to school, and when you're seven or eight or nine, some teacher says to you, oh, you could be male, you could be female, you could be a little bit male, a little bit female, in between both, neither, your gender could be a spectrum, oh, it could be something much more dramatic, you know? You're like, oh, I have to think about this now. And then, you know, what boring person wants to just be a male or just be a female if you could be gender fluid or on a spectrum um, or something? And all of this seems to be, again and again, based on old-fashioned gender stereotypes. Well, what else is there? To, you know, so that particular book, the one that you, you mentioned, it's by a chap called Ollie Pike, and he's very careful not to say how the child is meant to work out, whether they're these, you know, partly male, partly female, both or neither. Yes. But, I mean, you're then just leaving the child in completely in the dark. And kids by now, they know that, you know, blue is the boy colour and pink is the girl colour and sparkles are for girls and football is for boys and things. So even though you're not saying it, you are saying it. Yes. So do you think that a lot of the problem is that when most people think about the trans issue, they assume you're talking about what we used to call transsexuals, people who, for whatever reason, feel deeply uncomfortable in their own body. They have to either go through surgical procedure or change the way they present in order to live a happy life. And those people obviously deserve sympathy and support and, and the rest of it. But this is not quite that, is it? No, it's not. I mean, those people, um, one of my friends once uh, likened them to sort of witness protection. They were so rare mm. that you could accommodate them as special cases. Yes. And most of us would never meet somebody like that. So that's one thing. But now it's a social contagion. Yes. And it, this idea, you know, we know this happens. We know this happens particularly with teenage girls. This happens a lot. Like eating disorders or, or self-harming, you know, cutting. These things run through classrooms. And there are ideas that some, if somebody didn't have the idea, they wouldn't do it. But now they have the idea, you know, you feel uncomfortable, you don't feel right, you... You know, you don't like, I mean, I'm sorry to say there's a lot of porn goes around the place in schools, like boys may show you things on their phone, or in particular girls who are starting to think that they may be lesbian, that's such a porn word to a lot of girls. Mm. So they're, you know, they're, they're discovering who they are at 14, 15, at the same time as they're being made feel massively uncomfortable about it. And the idea that's presented to them, the one fix for everything is, you might be trans. Yes. And that would resolve all of these difficulties. Yes, that's the other problems. thing is that, you know, if, you, if somebody says to you, you've got, you know, you're on the autistic spectrum or, you know, it's very hard to cure um, eating disorders or something, you know that there's a great difficulty in front of you and a lot of sadness. But mm. this is being presented as a one size fits all solution for absolutely everything. And there are all these YouTube influencers who are selling these most unrealistic descriptions of how wonderful it is to be on testosterone and how great they feel and... You know, adults don't know about this stuff. You have no. to look for it. There's this whole world out there where the children are teaching each other absolute nonsense. And that's particularly uh, troubling for young gay people. Yes. I know there are lots of gay activists who are very 
they've basically come out of retirement to deal with this issue because there's a fear that effectively what, what they're doing here is erasing gay kids, and and fixing and other, gay kids. I and suppose. there's other gay men in particular um, who are all for it. And I'm sorry to say that some of those are the ones who were in the closet during Section 28. Yes. And they've come back now to try to make up for that. They see this as the fight that they can fix. And they're also the gay men who don't much like women. There's lovely men like you, Andrew, and then there's some gay men who really don't think much of women. Right. Now, when you wrote this book, of course, you... I mean, you must have been putting yourself in the firing line because it's such a contentious issue, whether it should be or not, yeah. is, is besides the point. But had you any idea of what you were letting yourself oh, of course in for? I did. Of course I did, because, I mean, you know, as soon as I started trying to write an article about it, the very first article I wrote, I called people and I talked about it the same way as I had talked about every other article. And, you know, people have said to me, you know, you were, you were the finance editor. But I had been in Brazil, I had talked to corrupt politicians, I had written articles about things like the effect of pornography on teenagers or on paedophilia and how you should deal with paedophiles, that sort of thing. And this was new. Mm. I would ring somebody and I would say, um, you know, can I just talk through with you the idea that, um, you know, what makes us a man or a woman is actually how we feel. And, you know, that might actually cause problems in certain spaces. And they would call me a literal Nazi, say that I wanted them all dead. As a first reaction? Yes, yes, okay. yes, absolutely. That was the way it was. Like, if you are talking to those people, I will not talk to you. Well, that, surely, as a journalist, that would make you want to investigate it more, wouldn't it? Well, it, it? did. But yeah. I, mean, I do wonder, a lot of journalists have said to me that they wouldn't touch it with a barge pole for exactly that reason. And I think, oh, you're the sort of journalist who'll run away from the burning building, aren't you? Yeah. you know, maybe go and do something else. Yeah, exactly. You know, maybe go and walk dogs or something instead. Because, because clearly, it's such a disproportionate reaction to say, when someone asks a legitimate question, to say you're a Nazi. It's yeah. so extreme. Something's being hidden there. Exactly. Something's exactly. going on. Exactly, exactly. So that is what interested me. And then it was meeting the kids. Mm. And thinking, well, yes, detransitioners. And that really was the moment when I thought, you know, because before that I was thinking, this is very interesting and I think I could write a book, but am I the right person? Yeah. Not yeah. so much that I was scared about it, but just, you know, I mean, I don't have any skin in the game. Yes. I know yeah. that. And I, yeah. and I have got attacked for that. People have said, you know, look, what's a straight, cis, white, blah, 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 blah. But on the other know? hand, you know, considering uh, the potential threat to women's rights, yeah. single sex spaces, that kind of thing, then surely... Yeah. That you do have some skin in the game in that respect. I do, but of course they deny that. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I also feel, you know, there's been, there's, we are at a wonderful moment for um, women's activism and general sex-based rights activism in this country. There's all these amazing groups that are <coughs> firing up, you know, yes. Fair Play for Women, sex, um, sex Matters, which is where I work now as the Director of Advocacy. I've taken time out from The Economist to um, go and do that. So it's actually very invigorating and exciting, too, to see you know, at the ground floor, a whole new sort of activism. Yes, absolutely. And do you feel that there is much that you can do with the kind of more, shall we say, histrionic reactions from the activist contingent, who still continue to brand people like you Nazis and fascists, but also send some... I mean, I think this is what has woken a lot of people up to the problem, is they've seen the death threats, the rape threats, the extreme dare I say, a very hyper-masculine reaction to a lot of this. You know, is that, is that difficult to deal with or is that something... No, I think it's brilliant. I mean, they're showing themselves up. Yeah. So I just, I also, I, I, I just, I treat them like I treat toddlers. Yeah. You know, I've had two kids and when you've got a kid who's lying on the floor, drumming their heels and screaming their heads off about, I know they don't want to brush their teeth. But... Deep breath. You know, and just repeat the calm mantras and so on, and then let them show themselves up for who they are. And so, in a sense, that, those kind of reactions might be the thing that helps uh, oh, yeah. this through. You know? Yes, absolutely. I mean, if we're just relentlessly reasonable, then mm. the relentless trolls show themselves for what they are. And do you think things have got worse or better since you first published the book last year? Oh, loads better in terms of being able to speak. But, you know, the, the more we speak, the angrier they get. I yes. think the only way out of this, as I think I've said to you before, is through. Like, you know, we just have to get to the other side. We actually have to defeat these people. Yes. There are reasonable people over there that we need to talk to in government, leading corporations, you know, in the NHS or in education. Yes. But the people who are screaming Nazi at the very idea that you might open your mouth... Yes. ..just got to beat them. So, just to wrap up, because I want, I want people to uh, be aware of your book and the new paperback version, obviously, is just out. What, so, this is out this week, is that right? It was out last week. So, there's, um, there's three things that you can do. You can read the book, um, you can follow me on Twitter at hjoycegender, and I have started a newsletter which is at my website thehelenjoyce.com fantastic helen well thanks for coming on and i really do heartily recommend your book thank you very much for your time thank you andrew after the break on free speech nation i'm going to be joined by the editor of spiked online tom slater to discuss the future of the labor party don't go away
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. <laughs> To Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Later in the show, I'm going to be turning Agony Uncle with the help of my panel, Leo Curse and Stephen Grant, to help you deal with your unfiltered dilemmas. So please do email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk and we will try our very best to answer your personal problems. Believe me, it works. It's great. Just email us. For the Labour Party, Thursday was a landmark night in London. They won control of three councils from the Conservatives, notably Westminster and Wandsworth. In the rest of England, though, it was a different story. Once again, Labour struggled in the Red Wall, which was breached so spectacularly by the Tories in the 2019 general election. Despite the cost of living crisis, Partygate and the numerous other scandals that have hit the government in recent months, Labour still seem unable to convince enough voters to put their trust in them. Tom Slater is the editor of Spiked. On Friday, he wrote about the problems facing Labour, and he joins me now. Tom Slater, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So, mixed results for Labour, in a sense. I mean, they, they were sort of cheering up these gains that they made. Mm. But as you pointed out in your article, they're all in London. I mean, that, that's not exactly where they need to be making these gains, is it? Exactly. I mean, Labour really struggled, basically, in non-London England. Yes. Um, and I think, if anything, the focus on the fact that they won in Wandsworth and Westminster and Barnet rather speaks to their problem, really. Yes. It's the fact that they're still struggling if, or actually going backwards in those Midlands and Northern seats that they so catastrophically lost at the last election. And they're just showing no signs of really being able to make up that difference. They're not completely in the doldrums. This government has given them a lot of open goals, essentially. <laughs> but even with that, they're still on track, it looks like, at this point, not to be the largest party. Nowhere near a majority at this point. And they're just still, I think, even given the circumstances that have been handed to them, they're struggling to make up that difference. So how can that be? Because, you know, Partygate, it's been relentless. It went on for ages because there was mm. one revelation after another. And just when you thought people got bored of it, something else turned <laughs> up. You know, so there's just so much there. It was the gift that 
kept on giving and giving and giving and yeah. <laughs> giving, and yet I think it's shown the limits of what Starmer's tried to do, which is almost like politics of like lockdown respectability. Yes. I'm a straight edge. I follow all the rules. Lisa Nandy this morning called him Mr. Rules. I was oh, trying to. What a terrible him. nickname. <laughs> no, no one's enticed by Mr. Rules, no. as far as I can tell. Um, and of course, it's come back to bite him because he's invested so much in this, and now we've got um, Korma and Beer Gates or whatever it's yes. been called at the moment, where he himself is being investigated under all of this. So I think just this kind of abstract sense that he wanted to project of I'm respectable, um, I am electable. If you haven't got anything to back that up, voters aren't going to turn out for you. And I, I think mean, that's something that we're seeing now. Is he electable? I mean, is, isn't the initial selection of Starmer the problem? Wasn't Starmer the chief architect of Labour's disastrous second referendum policy in the first place? Well, this, this is exactly it. I mean, he's kind of tried to pretend and tried to distance himself from that now, saying that he accepts Brexit as a fact. But as we all know, the thing that really pried those working class voters away from Labour or out of not voting to vote for the Tory party last time around was that issue of Brexit. He is the architect of the second referendum policy. I think also on a lot of these kind of cultural issues that you've been talking a lot about on your show, Starmer, he's not a kind of paid up member of the woke establishment, if mm. you see what I mean. He seems probably as uncomfortable with these issues as anyone else. But he does feel the need to genuflect to it, to kind of give in to it. Well, he literally, can't... actually, he took the knee during the Black Lives Matter. <laughs> literally, as yeah. you say. And, you know, he can't... Aunt... He... The... What I find fascinating about him is that there's... on so many issues that he's really gone to war with the left of the Labour Party. You know, he even expelled Jeremy Corbyn. He's even been leaning right on issues of crime and drugs recently, things that really infuriate the left of the party. But a lot of these woke left issues he's willing to kind of go along with it. He can't answer a straight question like, do only men have penises? And I think the, that fact, I think, is at least part of the picture of why people are still that little bit repelled from the Labour Party. Still. But is there anyone in the Labour Party that ever would do anything but capitulate to those issues? I mean, even Jeremy Corbyn was announcing his pronouns and <laughs> buying into all of that kind of stuff. I know the idea that anyone was ever in the dark as to whether Jeremy Corbyn was a man or a woman <laughs> did that. It's very strange. But no, you're right. I mean, I think the problem is, is that even though a lot of the people, particularly those running the Labour Party now, broadly speaking from the kind of centre-right or the sort of soft left of the party, um, they don't really believe in a lot of this stuff. Some of them will, of course, but um, they. But nevertheless, they feel the, the sense, and the rightful sense in, in, in a way, that their base, the dynamism, the, a large proportion of the membership and all the rest of it, really care about this stuff. The problem is that the rest of the country are, to the extent that they know about it, yes. they don't like it. I mean, there was a poll last year about just kind of woke politics in general. Something like 12% of people call themselves woke, 23% will say they're not, and 59% have no idea what it means. Right. Which I think tells you something about how distant on these issues the Labour Party is from a lot of the people that they really need to win over if they're going to be even within striking distance, minority government territory of being in number 10 Downing Street. So, so there's two issues there really, isn't there? So first there's Brexit, you know, with 70% of, of Labour constituents voting leave, mm -hmm. it probably wasn't a great idea to go back to the electorate and say, you got it wrong, do it again. Because <laughs> that's fairly insulting mm. to their core base. But then on the second hand, you've got this the, the kind of culture war stuff, which, as you point out there, is being waged by a very minor, a small minority yeah. of activists. Most people don't know about this stuff or even care about this stuff. They care about money yeah. and, and, and whether they can feed their kids and mm. that, that kind of stuff. So why is it... Why It seems very obvious to me that if Labour want a shot at this, they have to reconnect with those issues. Why can't they see it? I think because they are in hock in terms of who runs the Labour Party, who campaigns for the Labour Party, the people who are the most passionate members. It's basically split. There used to be this old cliche that Labour is a coalition of Hampstead and Hartlepool, you know, the yeah. traditional working class and the kind of liberal left intelligentsia. In terms of the people the most involved in the Labour Party now, it's a battle between Hampstead and Hackney, and I mean the, like, the gentrified bits of Hackney. Yeah, um, yeah. That's really what we're talking about here. It's the Starmerites and the Corbyn Easters. It's two kind of bourgeois factions fighting over a comb, effectively. And this yes. is the problem that they find themselves in. So they expend so much time, so much energy on these issues and these bizarre, strange, identitarian talking points that we find ourselves having to combat um, at the expense of actually trying to make something resembling a credible case. But, but it's really important for everyone, whether you support Tories or support Labour, it's really important to have a credible opposition, isn't mm. it? To have someone, so someone there. So what do you think would be the best approach for Labour now? Is it to embrace more traditionally left-wing ideas? Is it to focus more on economic inequality? Is it to, is it to, uh, to, to uh, you know, rejuvenate the relationship with the trade unions? What is it? It's so difficult because the, the world has fundamentally changed. I think that's one of the things that we have to reckon with. You know, the trade union movement is a shadow of what it once was. Yeah. To a large extent, what we've been living through is the fact that we have had this kind of class realignment of politics because of the fact that that old left-right split 
wasn't really working anymore. The last election, the Tories had this huge lead in amongst um, working class voters. Yeah. This is historically unprecedented. It's not just because the messaging of the Labour Party was wrong. It's not even just entirely the fact that Jeremy Corbyn took the Labour Party down a particular kind of rabbit hole that uh, voters didn't want to follow them down. It was also the fact that just underneath the surface, politics has changed fundamentally. Mm. And I don't know what Labour's route back is. I mean, people talk about them losing the Red Wall. They also lost another Red Wall before that, which was Scotland. If we're even talking about Labour maybe getting into government, we're not talking about a majority here. No one's really leaving that to happen. Exactly, or some sort of minority government propped up vote by vote by the other party. So it's just struggling to fundamentally reckon with that issue. But is there a road back at this point? I'm not sure. Well, could it potentially be a new leader in some way? I mean, is Starmer, do you think, the right person to carry them forward? Well, it's difficult because he is so inc incredibly and sort of uniquely uncharismatic. I mean, a <laughs> negative charisma. Like, and you combine that with not a lot of politics to speak of. You combine that with the fact he was the architect of the second referendum policy, yeah. as you've mentioned. It seems like an absolutely dreadful mix. But the, the reason that he won points to the problem with the Labour Party is who else? That's who it. else is there? Who else has that kind of stature, that even just a sense of common touch? I mean, really, it's not all just about branding and all the rest of it. But they don't even have anyone who could do that effectively at no. this point, it feels like. So I should say, I don't think it's completely out of the question that um, he could be our next prime minister. But to the extent in which, will that be a kind of sustainable majority? Almost certainly not. And second of all, what's the Labour Party for? It exists to represent the interests of the working class. And yeah. there's no sense in which, even if it does get into power, that that's what, as a political movement, it will be doing in power, if you see what I mean. Well, it uh, sounds very dismal for the Labour Party from your uh, account, but, you know, <laughs> we, we shall see what happens. Um, thank you, Tom Slater, ever so much for joining me. Thank you. Coming up... On Free Speech Nation, there's going to be an exclusive clip from my latest podcast, uh, which this week is with the uh, former footballer Matt Letizier. You don't want to miss that. Don't go away. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10am until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Woodson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Woodson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. So on my upcoming podcast episode, I'm joined by former footballer Matt Letizia. In our conversation, we spoke about life growing up on Guernsey, how he came to be a professional sportsman, his thoughts on lockdown and media conformity, and his well-publicised departure from Sky Sports in 2020. The, with the way that um, the company have gone uh, in terms of their, their diversity and all that kind of stuff, I think it was pretty, a, a pretty bad look for them to yes. have uh, a, a very popular Saturday afternoon show with, with five middle-aged, I might be being generous with middle-aged, but five middle-aged <laughs> white blokes on there. So, uh, and, you know, I, 
I listen. I'm all for proportional representation on the on the television. I think it's right that that television should be a reflection of what we see in society. But then some people have said because of your views on lockdown, for instance, that that has had an impact or anything. But but you know, and this seems to be a broad thing in not just in football or in TV or in the media is that this idea that people shouldn't express an opinion that is that is outside a certain limit of acceptability, shall we say. <laughs> uh, and I think that's particularly the case in broadcast media. Yeah, um, it, it has been. Um, it's been uh, something that I've had to put up with for the last couple of years because I've, I've questioned um, certain decisions that have been made. Um, uh, I think given, given a chance to do it all again, mm. uh, would I do the same? Yeah, if I, even with the consequences, I'd do the same again because I feel it's the right thing to do. Um, I, I was very concerned that we were only being given one side of the story. Um, this is about the lockdown. With lo with, well, <laughs> uh, with, with everything, really. <laughs> uh, lockdowns, uh, vaccines, um, war reporting. Uh, I, think, I think it worries me when you're just given uh, one side of the story yes. and the other side is just completely ignored, censored, banned from social media yeah. for having a slightly different opinion. I'm of the opinion that we should be able to debate openly all sorts of topics, um, and we haven't been able to do that uh, for the last couple of years, uh, and that's concerned me greatly. Um, I'm, I'm very much uh, in favour of open and honest debate, um, and I don't think... I think individuals should be able to hear both sides of the story mm. and then make up their own mind what they think. Whereas the last couple of years, all we've had is phew, one side of the story, bang, you're just getting that. COVID, 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 COVID. The whole time, all fear, a lot of fear mongering in the, in the media. Uh, and I don't think it was good for people's mental health, yeah. quite frankly. Uh, and I think we're seeing that in, in what's happened with children uh, and the, the mental health problems that, that, that has risen considerably. Um, uh, and I think we went about things in the wrong way. And I was uh, vocal about it. Uh, I was criticised for that, and that's fine. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Yeah. If they want to criticise me, no problem at all. Um, but I just felt like only one side of the story was being given, and, I, and I, I'm passionate. I think it's probably the Libran in me which, <laughs> which likes uh, the balance and the fairness okay. in life. Yeah. Uh, and I want everybody to be able to see that there is another side to the narrative um, that might just be a better way to go about things. And why can't we sit and talk about it and have a debate uh, and then make up our minds after that? But we were never given that opportunity and that, that concerned me. Because this feels like a relatively, I know this has always been the case to a degree, but it feels like it's been ramped up to the point where people have a view that is unfashionable, say. And other people, rather than say, oh, I disagree with that, I hate that view and this is why, They'll say, I, I think we should silence that view. I don't, yeah, you know, absolutely. That feels like a development that's relatively recent. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think um, the social media, the big social media platforms have, have um, been one of the big reasons for that. Um, I think the, uh, the idea of freedom of speech seems to scare a lot of people um, because they don't want their orthodoxy to be challenged. They don't want their opinions to be challenged in any way, shape or form. Uh, and that's not the way we progress as a society, in my opinion. Yeah. So um, uh, I don't think that's the, the right way for our, for our society to go. And I think this has had an impact on football. And it did, I think, particularly with the, the BLM movement and where all of a sudden um, uh, players were taking the knee, uh, wearing the sort of symbols. And some people were raising the point that that because everyone agrees that Black Lives Matter, the concept, obviously, Absolutely. and everyone agrees that racism, there's, there's no place for racism in a civilized Absolutely. society. But there was the other aims of the movement that I think were being overshadowed. And I think you'd mentioned this as well. Yeah, um, I did. I, it, it certainly deserved a conversation, I suppose. Is yeah, it, it did. I just thought they could have done things in a better way. Um, so I'd kind of read up a little bit about the, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and what they stood for mm. uh, and what they wanted to do. And I just felt like to, for the Premier League to align themselves with those three particular words, uh, I, I thought were, was the wrong thing to do at that time mm. because of everything else that they stood for. I thought there could have been a better choice of how 
we fight racism. Uh, there have been other campaigns to kick absolutely. racism out. Absolutely, you know, kick racism out has, has, has been going for a long time. Um, and uh, that's why I, I decided, because they, when I, when I went, went into work one day, um, just before we were about to go on air, mm. uh, our producer came in and, and handed everyone a badge. And it, and it was the Black Lives Matter badge. Uh, and I was really uncomfortable with this. Um, and, and I said to him, I said, do I have to wear this badge? Uh, and he looked at me and he went, it's probably in your best interest if you do. Right. And I was like, oh, okay. Now this is like 60 seconds before we're about to go on air. So I was like, what? So, so anyway, I, we all put the badges on. Uh, but it, it really bothered me throughout the show. And at the end of the show, I, I went to the producer and I said, look, I said, I, I'm not comfortable wearing wearing that badge. Mm. So I, I understand what that movement is and what they stand for. I don't agree with that. Uh, I'm quite happy to wear the kick racism out badge every time you want me to wear it on the television. I'm quite happy to do that. I'm in no way uh, uh, a racist. Uh, and I, I mean, who, who doesn't agree? I mean, Yes, there'll, there'll always be a minority of, of people who, who are racist, um, but I think the huge majority of people in this country are not racist people. Uh, well, I mean, football fans overwhelmingly have supported the kick racism, racism absolutely, out campaign. Absolutely, you know. absolutely, and there's never been any problem with that. So, but then it came to the point with, with Black Lives Matter because it, it felt like a political movement that had other goals, defunding police, yes. dismantling uh, heteronormativity, the nuclear family, etc., that kind of thing, which was all, all on the website. It was all there Absolutely. to be seen. Absolutely. So, you know. um, but then the reaction from some fans to the taking the knee when they were booing, for instance, and that kind of thing. Yep. How did you feel when a lot of commentators just said, if they're booing, they're racist? That's what they're doing. Do you think that's right? Do you think there's an element of that? No. Nope. No, I don't think that's right. I think that uh, I think that was um, a term that's now been bandied about to try and stifle any kind of debate. Um, just because you know they booed because of what it represented, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. I think there was, and that's why I say they should have used a different slogan, yes. uh, a different way uh, to. That was that was such a. Uh, a coincidence that those words were used when this movement was kicking off in America. Um, that I, I just felt like it was it was a really poor move, PR wise, to use those words, and it should have been done different. You can listen to my whole conversation with Matt Letizia on my podcast, which is called Free Speech Nation, the podcast that goes live right at the end of this show. That's at nine p.m. If you're a new viewer or listener. It's now eight o'clock. You're watching Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. OK, so we're in the second hour of the show. Let's discuss some more topics with the panel. Uh, this week, the comedian Dave Chappelle became the latest person to be confronted on stage when he was attacked by a man whilst performing at the Hollywood Bowl. Chappelle has been criticised for jokes about trans people in a recent stand-up show. That was Sticks and Stones. You might have seen it on Netflix. At this year's Academy Awards, Chris Rock was, was slapped by Will Smith after he made a comment about Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith. So, Leo, have you ever been attacked on stage? You should have been. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been attacked on stage, but uh, I've had to get off the stage to attack someone to get them out of the audience. Oh, really? Because yeah, because I do the free fringe in Edinburgh, so you don't have security or anything. No, so it's you've got to be your own bouncer. It's scary. It's my first ever gig at the Edinburgh Fringe was a free fringe gig, and we had ten odd football fans, Sunderland fans, drunk. <laughs> But it's sort of come in. There's no big bouncer on the door or anything yeah. like that. I hope they weren't chanting anything problematic. They, they were actually chanting homophobic slurs at right. me. <laughs> and then one of them vomited in a pint glass. <laughs> and, um, and the thing is, when you're in that situation, you've got the mic, you weirdly feel a bit invincible. So I was yeah. sort of flirting with them. And, <laughs> and they, that was making them more angry. And, you know, <laughs> they didn't kill me there. But they could have done, couldn't they? They could have yeah. just come up and, you know, this is the, there is a vulnerability, isn't there, about being on stage? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it does happen. Uh, it's, it's, it, it seems to be increasing as well. Yeah. Um, not just the tax, but people uh, voicing their opinions or trying to grab the microphone. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, coming out of lockdown, people didn't seem to be able to hold their booze at all. Yeah. And, uh, and also there's, uh, there's people miss... 
misinterpret or misunderstand. I've seen it happen to Nico Yearwood, uh, Jeff Innocent, um, who, who does material, fantastic material about how... Uh, so he's, he's, you know, he's in a mixed-race family. He's the only white guy in his family. His wife is black and his kids are, are mixed-race. Yes. So he does all these you know, really funny jokes about how you know, he can't chase his wife down the street uh, or you know, it looks racist and, and whatever. Yeah. But somebody misunderstood what he was saying and, uh, and thought he was, uh, he was actually being racist. So this is interesting, isn't it, Stephen? Because I think that there should be that lev level of trust in the performer, as in if you hear them talking about sensitive issues like race or sexuality or whatever, the, the first assumption should be they're not being racist or homophobic, they're doing something comedic with this, right? Well, actually, and it's going to sound weird for me to say this, but even if it was racist or homophobic, let them say it and get to the end and decide whether you think it was afterwards, but see if there was a motivation behind that. And if you're not happy with it, I would recommend not getting up on stage and punching them. Well, sure, I, exactly. I, I just, I, and, and by the way, I mean, you probably thought on the basis of Leo's more bombastic style than me uh, that I would not be uh, the party to this. I've actually been attacked on stage. Really? Yeah, and I've been punched in the face. If you put Stephen Grant punched heckler into Google, you will find <laughs> the fact that not only was I attacked oh, when I stepped off stage at a venue in Brighton once, but Steve Coogan ran after the guy who punched me. And then afterwards, wow. and, they, and they, the son ran with Coogan's run, uh, which was, I thought was lovely. <laughs> so wait, that. so was this relatively recently? No, I mean, this is this is talking about sort of 15, 16 years ago. What, what, why, why did this happen, though? What? I, th I did a joke about uh, American people, and I think this guy was either had an American friend or was American or something. At least he wasn't armed, because most of them are. And, and that's the beautiful thing about when they arrive in this country, we tend to take the weapons off. Them, don't we? So, you know, whether we actually then give it back to them on their return journey, I'm not sure. But yeah, I mean, it's it, it's an absolute it's an absolute must that, that performers are allowed to do what they do. It's yeah, the 1948 course. Geneva Convention on Human Rights. As a <laughs> performer, we're actually allowed to say whatever we like. Well, particularly comedians. Comedians have always historically been the ones that can say the unsayable, or at least the things that you're not like Leo's fool. You say the the thing that anyone else would get executed by the king for. Yeah. The court jester can do it. Because that's the point. That's sort of the role, isn't it? Yeah, and also it's because it's under the, the context is is one of making a joke. I, I know it sounds strange because you, it's almost a bit like saying, well, in that case, then if you say something wildly offensive and it's not funny, yes, then that in that case it, it, it is a borderline hate crime because you have said something motivated entirely by a, a perspective of you know like punching down or hatred or something like that. But of course, the ability to know whether something's funny or not is is entirely subjective. In fact, there's no other art form more subjective. Yeah, I think than exactly. comedy anyway. Um, so I, I'm very much of the opinion that you know, um, you know, it, you, you, the examples you gave was great. Jeff Innocent's a great one as well. That, but he's, but, but comics are good at doing that kind of. You think it's going to be completely out of order, and then it's not. Exactly. And I, I do jokes about the fact that you know, um, you know, that I, I'm trying to make out that I'm a good person, saying, you know, like, I would never be unfaithful, I can't even I can't even sort of pleasure myself without feeling like I'm being unfaithful to whoever I'm with. I have to spend the ten minutes before it imagining she's died. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's incredibly dark, but the first part of the joke makes out I'm a good person, the second part makes out I'm a monster. Sure. It's the whole idea behind it is a joke. If you thought that was literally what I'm like, then you shouldn't be at a comedy show. And if you're upset by it, the very last thing you should do is get up on the stage and punch me in the face. Yeah. So, is, I mean, you say, Leo, that this is happening more and more. Do you think the will Smith slapping incident has made this more likely to happen again. I think it's very likely that that, that was the sort of uh, impetus and spur behind the, the Chappelle attack. Right. Because uh, it, was, it was only like a week or two afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, pretty pretty similar uh, attack. Although the, the attacker went on stage with a... With a I think it was a gun. It was a knife disguised as a gun. It was a knife disguised as a gun. If you yeah. can yeah. a knife <laughs> Like, you're not going to... It's not like a gun is... Uh... <laughs> no, if you're going to have a weapon, disguise it as like a teddy bear. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. Like that. Don't no, it as, a, as an even more extreme and weapon. Then he got on stage and didn't even <laughs> use it. He just rugby tackled him. So, uh, so he'd be terrible in a, in a, in a war zone. <laughs> um, he'd just take his shoes off and throw them at the enemy. But um, yeah, I mean that's but that's the thing, isn't it? The, the, like when you see someone high profile like Will Smith doing that at the Oscars, and he doesn't get. He doesn't even get asked to leave, let alone arrested. He was applauded. He was applauded by by Hollywood. Stood up and gave him a, gave him a standing ovation yeah. for uh, for punching a comedian. I mean, to be fair, comedians at the Oscars tend to come on and make fun of all the rich actors sit, sitting out there. So then the rich actors get get a chance to you know applaud somebody who's, who's uh, you know enacted their revenge. Yes. Um, but yeah, it, the, the entitlement in in audiences now. I mean, I had somebody. Uh, come to my show. Well, they wrote a wrote a letter of complaint, an email of complaint to one of the comedy clubs I do a solo show at every every month or so. And they said we came to see the show in July. 
and uh, it was horrific and offensive. And we came back to see Leo again in, in October, and he was still horrific and offensive. <laughs> You please stop putting him on. And, you know, I mean, people this... don't understand that not everything is made specifically for them. No, but that's it. I mean, the, the idea that I would go to a comedy club and assume that some, I, I could never hear anything that might have a particular sensitivity for me. I mean, how narcissistic, frankly, yeah. is that? It's ridiculous. Anyway, moving on now, I do want to talk about the RAF because an email sent earlier this week from the RAF comms team asked for someone to represent them at a press event connected to the, to the latest Top Gun film. But there's more. It was pretty specific. So the message said they were looking for someone who was preferably not a white male. The Ministry of Defence have apologised and said, said the language should not have been used. This Top Gun film has been in the... the go, it's been in the pipeline for ages, hasn't it? Yeah, I, think, yeah. I, didn't, didn't, I didn't Tom Cruise make this about a decade ago or something. <laughs> yeah. Or was that like the pandemic slowed it down or something? What do you make of this, though, Leo? Do you think the RAF should be saying no white men? Well, it's, it, their... seems, it seems ridiculous considering... I think, I think the RAF has some white men in it. I believe it does have and, some, yes. Uh, yeah, yes. I mean, to, to say such a sort of racially divisive thing and such, a, such an openly racist thing is openly discriminating against, against white men. Who... But, but, but that, the activists would say that's not racist because you can't be racist towards white people, right? Well, I mean, I'd say, where, where do we draw the line there? I mean, do we, do we eventually end with, uh, with white people in concentration camps explaining to them that they're not being discriminated against because of uh, what, whatever reason the activists... I mean, this is open racial discrimination against white men. So what's the point, Stephen? I think, I think the point is, I, I, I mean, they apologise for the use of their language, but can I just say that I think I've got an idea why they did this. Go on. And that is, there is, I would say, thankfully, less and less um, occupations in life which are so incredibly white male dominated. But RAF pilot, I'm going to put it out there, I think that's still the case. I think if the RAF want to reach out to their non-male and non-white pilots, they just email the, all three of them. It's OK, I mean, that's, it's just got to be but easier than sure? putting a sign I mean, up. I, I'll be honest, I, I don't know much about the RAF. My, my vision is of Biggles. Right, you know, the, the... It's, it's not far off that. I mean, oh, I, right. haven't, <laughs> I haven't done a huge amount of research into it other than looking at the... I, you know, when I, when I heard about this article, I looked up and I looked at the... I wasn't able to see RAF figures. I was looking at the commercial pilot yes. scenario and the commercial pilot scenario. They're kind of entwined because a lot of people join the RAF because the cost of learning to be a pilot privately is really quite high. And so they, they, they do their time in the RAF and they go on to be commercial pilots afterwards. It is extensively white male dominated. I understand why the RF would look... Would, it's, the, the RF okay. probably desperately want to get in a bit of diversity, and I can understand why they did that. The only problem with it is, is that by asking their very small demographic of people to do that, they are upsetting a huge number of existing... So, OK, do you take that point, though, Leo, that, you know, that they, they need to try and increase their diversity? But I think they've undermined that attempt by, by being openly discriminatory. And they, so they should have done it secretly? And they're, yeah, like, oh, let everybody apply and then just let the white people waste their time. That's how companies do it these days. <laughs> and that's, that's how I do it, because then you look good and you get the, you know, your... Uh, this just looks like tokenism. It yeah. really looks like... Yeah. Because it is tokenism. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what it is, yeah, sure. OK, so this next one uh, centres around a comment made by the outgoing director of the Royal Shakespeare Company, Gregory Doran, in relation to Richard III. So the protagonist is described in the play as uh, cheated of feature and unfinished. He's historically been played um, in a hunchbacked form or with a cane. And Doran's late husband, Sir Anthony Sher, played Richard III in 1984. But Doran now says having an able-bodied actor in the role today would probably not be acceptable. Leo, do you think that only a disabled actor should play a disabled role? No, because what they're doing is they're acting. So <laughs> <laughs> the person that's doing it is pretending to be someone else. I mean, where do we stop with this? If only disabled people uh, can play Richard III, why not extend that to only uh, monarchs? Or only Richard III can play Richard III? <laughs> it's, it's a very difficult... But, uh... OK, but wait a minute. So what about then if you cast... As, as happened recently, there was a black actor who played Anne Boleyn. Uh, would you have a problem with that? Or do you think that's, that's reasonable casting? I don't have a problem with that, because I don't want to look racist. OK, thank you, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> What do, you, what do you make of that? I, um, first of all, I think the phrase cheated of feature and unfinished was, I think, how your friend from Spike described Keir Starmer. Uh, I think I mean, he was... He was, he was pretty, and not the job. He was pretty brutal. Uh, he was, was a little bit, wasn't he? <laughs> but, I mean, I think, I think Leo's point about that they're acting 
is is important because yes. you can't have, for example, um, you know, and, and I agree. I actually, when you've got uh, black actors playing Shakespearean roles, I think I think of course because they're acting, that's absolutely fine. But likewise, you shouldn't. Ha I mean, the reason why they've gone down that route of saying that only disabled actors play disabled people isn't because they feel that that's important in this day and age. I think it's because if you are a disabled actor, you still have very limited roles, unless something is specifically written for you. So, you know, it, it, if you can only really ever do that, you know, then, 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 then obviously you should have, I was going to say a leg up, but that might be <laughs> offensive, but I am <laughs> into that role. But, but I, I also take the fact that I think they're talking about the live world, because the reality is in, in the movie world, um, yes. Actual disability, if it's a physical disability, is less and less becoming a barrier yes. to playing kind of blockbuster roles. Yes. In as much as there is so much CGI involved. Okay, but th th I think that, you know what? When it comes to Richard the Third, though, now Richard the Third is a hard role to play. You're the linchpin of that play. Yeah. Uh, uh, Shakespeare's not easy at the best of times. But look, you need a wide pool of actors to because to, to, there are very few people who could do that role well. Yeah. If you're then saying it can only be a disabled person, you might end up with a really bad... I'm not saying disabled actors are inherently bad, I'm saying you might end up with the wrong person for the role. Yeah, and I, I still be fundament, fundamentally it should be a meritocracy, but I certainly would think that if you had two people who were equally gifted for the role and one of them was, was uh, disabled, then give it to the disabled person because they're not really going to be able to play, you know, tights and a drama. Right, well, OK, but then what, where do we... I mean, look, for instance, what? so, for instance, could Leo play... Oprah Winfrey in a biopic of Oprah Winfrey, for instance. If he knocked say. it out of the park, that's the point <laughs> yeah, I make. Yeah, right? yeah. If he just came and turned to everybody in the studio audience and went, you've got a car, so much so that you felt you had a car, then I think he'd earned the role. Well, I don't know, because, I, I mean, I see, like, Brokeback Mountain, and I think those two guys were straight, but they, they seem gayer than any anyone else I know. <laughs> They're gayer than any of my gay friends. Yeah. So uh, that's convincing. That's You know, you, I don't think you need to be to share all the attributes of the character you're playing, do you? Uh, no. No, although the uh, the sex scene in Brokeback Mountain was was uh, not very realistic, it just went straight in, and um, that, there's no. <laughs> what are you four, saying here, Leo? Forty minutes with uh, you know KY Jelly and. Uh, okay, let's know. move on from that, <laughs> since we are a pre-watershed show. Right, um, yeah. But you did, but you accept my point, don't you? That, that yeah. I think there are some casting decisions that you would make that just seem inconceivable. Yeah. But like, but having a limp. For Richard III, or what? You know, I think anyone could potentially do that. Or am you I just can make a fake hunchback. You can I make mean, a. That's that's it's just. That's not the same yeah, as like blacking up, up, is it? No, it's not offensive it's, in that way. It's, yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. not a you know a, a social or it, it doesn't come with um, or maybe it does come with uh, with centuries of because uh, I guess disabled disabled people have been discriminated against. Oh, absolutely. I, I think, yeah. I think uh, the other thing is worth pointing out as well. It is not that straightforward for an actor to be convincingly disabled. No, this is yeah. true. And and and, and uh, the, I'm not saying that that was the point that they were making when they made that point. But I do believe that actually having a lifelong disability is a head start in acting somebody who is disabled. Okay. But, but, the, then, but the interpretation that Richard III is disabled is still mm. in the air. But are they going to specify which disability? Because if you had somebody with Down syndrome trying to play Richard III, I mean, that would be, you know, not particularly convincing. I think, I think with Richard III it could be a variety of different disabilities because I don't think Shakespeare is that c uh, clear about what it could be. So, I mean, you could... Kind of got a typically I, hunchback. I mean, it's Richard III. I think we can all safely say it was as a result of centuries of inbreeding. Very likely. Yeah. Although I don't even know if Richard III was disabled. I think there's some debate over that, because they found his remains in a car park in Leicester, didn't they? Yeah. He wasn't, apparently. He wasn't yes, actually fine. disabled. It was just a Tudor myth that Shakespeare then sort of capitalised on to make him more villainous. Mm. Anyway. Uh, well, let's move on uh, to our next topic. Are we, are we getting a bit trigger-happy with warnings on children's books? I'm talking here about Cambridge University who's defending their decision to warn students that The Little House on the Prairie... Uh, contains stere contain stereotypical depictions of Native Americans. The, book are set, the books are set in the 19th century. They were later turned into a popular TV series. And the university says that content notes help reduce the risk of psychological distress to students. They call them content notes, by the way, because the phrase trigger warning might trigger people because it's <laughs> related to guns. So they're now, say, they're now saying content notes. But, you know, the author of Little House on the Prairie, she was born in the 1860s, so she might have different views about the world than we do today, right? Yeah, definitely. You know, so, I mean, doesn't this... Also, aren't we dealing with adults at university taking a literature course? Can't they deal with Little House on the Prairie? Unless they stumbled across it without realising, I guess. I, I, I've got no problem with content notes, though, because, the reality, because they don't affect the actual text involved. I've got an issue when they go in there and change the text. But that's that does happen. That does yeah, happen. Well, yes, and then if you were to ask me about that, I would say that thing, that's unacceptable because you're changing the art. But I think if you've got a content at the beginning, okay. if you're basically saying, you know, like... It, 
you know, it's like going on a ride in the fair. You've got to be over this. You've got to be uh, over this height to go on it. Yeah, that's kind of fine. If they're basically saying, "Look, this was written in the 1860s," where ultimately there was a slightly different sensibility to do with men, women, and race, and all the rest of it. So basically, take it okay. as you will, Stephen. That's fine. No, but is it fine? Look, we're dealing with literature students at the top university in the world. If they don't know that literature sometimes contains troubling aspects, they shouldn't be doing that. Should they? Well, I, I, if, they're not children. If, you, if you're basically saying that, that, that you know, if you take the content notes out, then then they kind of they know what they're getting themselves into. But the, but you don't know who's going to read that. So you can they could be reading that and be fine, and then take that home, and then someone else could read it, and then they go, wow, this is a bit. I just don't buy it because I mean, look, I did a literature course, and I, I think if someone would have said to me, you do realise sometimes they talk about death and murder and that, yeah, it's literature. Yeah, but I worry that today's generation would actually avoid that. And I worry that the trigger warnings or content notes or whatever uh, phrase they use to denote that this, this book contains problematic scenes, uh, that's actually going to be used almost as a badge to sort of uh, get, get that book phased out of circulation and phased out of this. Well, no, we opposite. Well, I think well, the opposite. I think the badge will become a badge of honour. You know, when you sit and watch a film and it says this film contains gore, sex, you know, like swearing, offensive, whatever, you sit there and you think, absolutely brilliant, yeah. and you put your phone on silent no, but and you surround yourself in dips. But that's <laughs> a great we're evening. We're old guys. We're old guys. We grew up in the 90s when parental advisory explicit content was the thing that made you buy the album. Yeah. Like, this no. is what it... This is now... now this young, young I, generation, I, I, they're, they're grown up and they're... they're I think they if you terrified. open a book they're... now and it doesn't have a content advisory warning in the minute, you think this is going to be saccharine rubbish. Yeah, but Leo, uh, Leo, from Leo, your point of view... Leo's point, Stephen, is that, that you're all of that generation, but younger people, they, they, they see content where they see books as like bombs ready to explode little grenades, you know, when they see this thing and they think, oh, I must steer clear. And they're missing out on so much but, if they do that. But, but do they? Are they? Are, well, or, good I question. Think, because I don't think, I think your point is actually right, that if you've gone to a, do a literature degree uh, yeah. and you have gone through all forms of education to get to there, you have a voracious appetite for words and writing and you're not going to be uh, a, a, a kind of um, a, a lightweight who is going to be decimated emotionally no, sure. by the text. Within. But that said, I mean, what Leo says about the slippery slope thing is true. If you take the, you know, recently, I don't know if you read about this in Ottawa, there was a school board that took over 5,000 books off school and library shelves and burnt them and they because they had problematic depictions of race. And we're talking like books like The Handmaid's Tale, uh, Little, Little um, House on the Prairie, books like that, um, Huckleberry Finn. And they actually used the ashes. They called this a flame purification ceremony. <laughs> and they, they used the ashes to grow a nice new tree to celebrate diversity. <laughs> um, wow. So it's sort of a combination wow. of sort of very cute and cuddly diversity messaging and, uh, you know, Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> it's, it's, it, I mean, it's scary stuff, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's exactly what, what Hitler did, the, the, the book, piles of burning books. He didn't do the tree bit, though, did he? No. No, <laughs> no. so there you go. Uh, now, look, we're going to move on. <laughs> We're going to move on. That was the worst thing about him. <laughs> he didn't, didn't plant do the, the tree. tree. He didn't make it carbon neutral. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to... Anyway, we're going to move on to another question now. This is a story that broke this weekend. The Taliban have announced that the 20 million women in Afghanistan must wear the burqa. So women who do not wear the head-to-toe garment could be jailed for three days. You'll remember the Taliban retook control of Afghanistan last September. And since then, girls have been banned from secondary education, while women are not allowed to appear in films and telev television programmes. Um, now, look, when the Taliban came back into power, Stephen, a lot of people were saying that this is the new progressive Taliban. Yeah, the only you people know. saying that were the Taliban. Yeah, they were saying that, weren't they? They, yeah. they were saying that, you know, they're, they're the woke Taliban, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. like every, like every uh, aggressive partner coming back to the relationship, they've changed. <laughs> yeah. OK, yeah, and, and yeah of course. I Why mean, is like, anyone surprised then? Well, I, 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 it's... You know what? It, I would be able to laugh about it, but this is really depressing. Yeah, but, of because course. Because... You know, I'm not saying... It's, you're going to find very few people saying that the, the war against terror in Afghanistan was in any way a success, but it looked like there was genuine, tangible progress. And can I just say, actually, basically, it wasn't progress, you know, like uh, educating the savages. If you go to the mid-1970s in Afghanistan, yeah. women were openly going to university then and they weren't having to wear... The, you know, the, the Taliban came in and pushed things backwards in the 80s and the 90s, yeah. you know. Like, yeah. So this was returning to where they were in the 70s and pushed it back. It's... It yeah. is it's, no, I completely agree. It is completely depressing. I mean, you're not surprised, Leo, are you, to see this? No, no, I'm not surprised. <laughs> but I did read an article in The Guardian that says that the burqa is an empowering feminist uh, object of clothing, so surely it's uh, to be celebrated. Well, this is the other problem, isn't there? There's a lot of sort of the intersectional feminist movement who have, uh, uh, for some reason, placed Islam high up on their hierarchy of various grievances, mm. and they don't understand that, yes, it's a choice for women in the West to wear these garments. In some countries... Oh, 
Well, OK, for, for many it is. But in some countries, oh, you can, you can be imprisoned or, or at a physical risk if you don't. And that's a real problem, isn't it? This, this, this sort of myopia when it comes to this form of feminism. Why aren't people upset about this? Uh, I think it's because, uh, I don't know, in the, in the West we've become... Wokeism has made the West so sort of self-loathing and they can only see things through the prism of uh, white colonialism and, uh, you know, the West's, uh, you know, the bad things that the West have done. Um, so if, I mean, like, all the conversation around slavery seems to be around slavery that happened 400 years ago. Yeah. It's not around the slavery that's happening now. And there's, there's more slavery in the world now than there was at the height of the transatlantic slave trade. But it's being perpetrated in Libya, in the Middle East, in China with the Uyghur Muslims. Yeah. So it's more complicated. So, you know, people don't... Um, they, they don't... If, if you're attacking some uh, old white guy with a beard, then who's dead, that's a very easy then target. That's a very easy target. Yeah, right. so nobody, all these wokists, if they're scared of a little house in the prairie, they're not going to go to the Taliban and start <laughs> rattling cages, you know? They're absolutely not, you know. And we should have invited someone from the Taliban on to debate you, but, you know, they won't, they won't return my calls. I don't know what's going on there. Anyway, after the break on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be joined by Neil Oliver after a conference where he was due to speak was cancelled. I'll see you in two minutes. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10am until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. A conference to discuss the fallout from the pandemic has had to be moved to a new venue after a booking was cancelled due to the nature of the event. So last week, organisers of the Better Way conference were told they'd have to look for another location because some of its speakers could attract unwanted attention. It comes after a similar event that was due to take place in Guernsey last October was called off. So joining me now to discuss this, two of the contributors due to talk at the event, that's Dr. Tess Laurie, CEO of EBMC Squared, which is an independent, not-for-profit, health-focused think tank, and GB News presenter, Neil Oliver. Thanks both for joining me. <laughs> so, Dr. Laurie, if I can start with you, if I may. So, um, can you explain to us what was the background to the conference and when did you first hear that your uh, plans had been scuppered? Yes. Well, the World Council for Health um, is the is the, um, the the organisation that is behind the Better Way Conference, and it's really aimed at um, at you know people coming together in a very solutions focused way to um, to look at um, at basically the things that went wrong and the things that could be improved um, and 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 really empowering people to um, to take responsibility of their health yes. uh, going forward um, 
And so was it, the, and the, the event, the venue was fully aware of the content of the conference and what it would be about? Yes, it's a health-focused conference. Okay. Um, and do you have any sense in which why, did they give you any reasons as to why they were um, concerned? Well, um, they were concerned that, um, they, they, they said that we would upset the vaccine rollout in Bath. Now, um, you know, with, with the emerging data, uh, with this Pfizer data coming out showing that the Pfizer trials are fraudulent um, and, um, and uh, you know, doctors around the world are, are, are getting together saying, what can we do um, to, um, to, to uh, analyze the data properly to make sure um, people who are harmed get heard and so on. Uh, and um, it, we, you know, we just not, uh, we just haven't been getting um, uh, any any help with that? So um, we've um, the sorry, I, I beg your pardon. I'm, I'm losing my. No, it's fine. I, I will, well, bring Neil in at this point because I'm interested in in what people feel about this. Neil, uh, had you any idea, any inkling at all that this was going to happen? That they were going to say you can't have these conversations in our town? No, I really didn't. It came as a a, a, a real surprise to me. I actually heard about it from from the. The conference organisers uh, a, a couple of weekends ago, when I actually when I was on the train down from Scotland to come and, and present my own uh, show on on GB News, uh, and it, it was that was the first I had heard of it. With uh, the Bath the City Council, Town Council had decided that the conference was going to cast the town into some sort of disrepute. Uh, I was completely not sideways by it. My my reaction to having been invited to take part in the conference was only that I was, I, I mean, beyond delighted, beyond excited because of the the calibre of the of the of the people that were going to be there, including Dr. Laurie, who's with you now, uh, but people you know like Peter McCullough, Brett Weinstein, uh, Robert Malone, uh, Majid Nawaz, all sorts of people who, who previously Nick Hudson that, that I had only really interacted with online. And, and to me, it was just going to be this opportunity to be in the same room with people that I had listened to, gained an enormous amount of information, reassurance uh, from over the over the months of of lockdown and all and all the COVID restrictions and, and and all the rest of it, and you know not to put too fine a point on it, you know when I heard that that Bath had the t the council had decided to pull the venue, I just thought what a what a sad indictment on on free speech in the country, that a, a group wanting to gather together to look ahead. I mean it's very much a conference about trying to uh, distill from what we've experienced over the last couple of years what 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 ought better to be done in the future? How do we have uh, better communities that, that better share information? Uh, how do we uh, reintroduce trust in the media, reintroduce trust in our institutions? It was very much a gathering of people who, who wanted to say, right, let's let's see where we are, let's look ahead and, and try and see what we can learn from the situation, learn from the mistakes that have been made in the past. And, and, and to hear that it was being that there was an attempt being made to to pull the rug out from under it, I just thought was a, as I say, a sad indictment. What defence have they given, though? What defence have the, the the venue made for their decision? Because presumably they must have a very clear idea as to why it could not be tolerated. Well, as I, I haven't I haven't heard in great detail, as as Dr. Laurie said just a, a few moments ago. Uh, there was some reference made uh, to the to the possibility on from the point of view of the of the town of the town council that the topics that would be being discussed might in some way um, inhibit the vaccine rollout which uh, that that to me I, I have to say sounds tenuous at best uh, I did hear it may only be anecdotal uh, but there there was definitely a suggestion that the the council also felt that such a conference featuring the the speakers who were proposing to gather there would uh, would would in some way bring disrepute upon mm. the town which again I, I i i struggle to make sense of that i struggle to take that on board seriously these are it's an international conference it's it's some of the most highly qualified people so respected in their fields people who have made enormous contributions to their fields over the years uh, yes they have found themselves on the opposite side from some of the orthodoxy and some of the narratives that have been coming out from 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 governments and the rest but nonetheless it was a group of people wanted to come together see what could be learned and look ahead into the future and if that's not a positive i don't know what is
Dr Laurie, um, do you feel that this is an indictment on the state of free speech at the moment in the country? Because, you know, it feels like people are just nervous about people with different opinions expressing them. Yeah, absolutely. You would think at this time the governments and, and everybody would just be so happy that doctors and scientists are getting together to discuss what's going on because we've got, you know, we've got, we've, we've just got through a pandemic. We've got, um, uh, we've, we've been using a new um, type of therapy, uh, uh, new types of vaccines. You would really think that, that conversations between doctors and scientists would be really encouraged um, because, you know, we, we need to make sure that, um, that you know, we, we, do, we move forward in a positive way. But this has also been happening online, hasn't it? There have been people who've, who've been kicked offline for expressing well, views that are against the, the, the consensus. You know, I've... Um, you, you probably don't know me because I've been... Um, I've been censored from, from Twitter, from Facebook, from YouTube, from Vimeo um, since the beginning of last year. Right. Um, I worked as an external consultant to the World Health Organization for nine years and I did a, a very good review on ivermectin for prevention and treatment of COVID with a great team. And we've been trying to communicate the message that there's been effective safe treatment for COVID since the beginning of last year and we have not been heard. And, um, and it seems like there's been a concerted effort to suppress any information, not just about ivermectin, but about early treatments for COVID because the emergency use authorizations would not have been allowed for the vaccines if there had been effective treatments. But, but it, presumably you're not threatened by... If, if there are um, if those people who disagree with you, they should be able to say they disagree with you, yes. that you're wrong and this is why you're wrong. Absolutely. And all, is that not Everybody, part of... Exactly. Everybody's welcome to their own perspectives on everything. So why we can't get together and discuss, and I'm sure there'll be people with different perspectives coming to the conference, why we can't all get together to discuss the best way forward. Not just, you know, as I say, it's, we're not just um, looking at um, the, consequence, the health consequences of COVID. We're looking at how can we reclaim science? How can we get people to actively engage in their, in their communities um, towards, you know, making things better? How can we get people... Or how can we address, identify and address environmental challenges, which are numerous? Um, uh, how can we... What are the new ways of managing health going forward? So, um, and, and also how can the law serve human rights? So the, all sorts of things in this conference, it's seven panels, um, seven conversations, and um, there are international experts coming from around the world to join the conversations. Um, Neil, can I ask you, because I'll just bring you in here again, um, this feels to me like a broader conversation, not just about the science question, you know, that, 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 that there has been one accepted uh, opinion and other opinions have been marginalised there. But this has been happening in the world of comedy, in the world of arts. There have been comedians who've had their gigs uh, pulled, all sorts of things. What, what's going on here? There is some... Uh, I think uh, there, there's a, a process which feels driven uh, to, uh, to ossify and calcify debate. You know, rather than have a conversation that's fluid... And, and, and subject to change, rather than having people come together with opinions that might be malleable, uh, that might be modified, it, put people in circumstances where they might learn things from one another, because it's when you come into contact with, 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 uh, with opinions that are different from your own, that your own ideas are challenged and you possibly come away from that encounter learning something. But there's, there is definitely, it seems, a move away from that where there's, where there's an intention rather, rather than encouraging people to think for themselves, it's to tell people what to think. And where there are voices that, that stand aside from that and say, no, I don't want to be told what to think. I want to be invited to think for myself and to have a conversation with other people who have thought about the subject for themselves and to and to and, and from that process to come up with some kind of maybe shared understanding. It, it's in the very nature of what science is supposed to be about. I mean, one of the most influential nineteenth, uh, twentieth century philosophers of science, Karl Popper, you, you know, he said that a, a hypothesis was not science unless it was falsifiable. That you, it, it wasn't science. Your idea wasn't scientific unless it was structured in such a way that it ought to be and would be challenged. Because it's when ideas are challenged and sometimes disproved that our understanding moves on. If you just keep on having your idea reinforced 
if you're just in an echo chamber where all you hear is what you think being reinforced all the time, you don't actually learn anything. Science is never settled. It's a conversation. It's constantly fluid, or it should be, or it's not science. And this conference in Bath was, was going to be a perfect example of that, will be a perfect example of that. It's still going to go ahead in a venue yet to be decided, but it will go ahead and it will bring together people who've got different ideas about how we should look ahead, what we can learn, and how we take the conversation forward. And for me, to be opposed to that kind of fluidity and that kind of sharing of ideas is the antithesis of science, the antithesis of free speech, the antithesis of conversation. Thank you, Neil. So I'll just come to you finally, Doctor. If you could just tell us about the conference, where people can find information about it. Yes, um, it's um, thebetterwayconference.org, uh, and you can also find information about it on the World Council for Health.org website. It is still going ahead. We have a venue, and um, Yes, and it's all confirmed, but in actual fact, we're sold out. <laughs> oh, right, OK, well, there we're, we go. We're sold out, but you can get virt virtual tickets. So there's many, many virtual tickets, obviously, available. OK, so. right. Well, um, I mean, of course, with all of these things, you know, I haven't, we haven't looked into the data here to uh, address the specific points you made about, uh, <coughs> about the virus. But I think the idea of the conversation should go ahead. People should be able to discuss it and debate it. You know, I don't think people should be threatened by debate. Exactly. Well, I just want to say, it's really not about the virus. You know, it's really about... The way forward for us, you know, okay. things are not. I think we all realise that um, we're at the absolute worst health ever, uh, individually and collectively, mm. uh, and we really need to improve health. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, and thank you, Neil. So after the break on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be joined by historian David Aldroyd Bolt on the 77th anniversary of VE Day. See you shortly. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us, 10am until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Woodson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Woodson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, reacting to the big stories of the day, comedy legend Bobby Davro, radio and TV presenter Neil Dr. Fox, and writer and broadcaster Ingrid Tarrant. Is Keir Starmer's position now untenable? Find out in my big opinion monologue. In the big question, should Britain pay reparations for slavery? And my Mark Meets guest is one of the most feared political biographers in the country, Tom Bauer, a man who's written explosive books about Tony Blair, Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson. Unmissable Sunday Night TV. See you at nine.
Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. Today is the 77th, 77th anniversary of VE Day, when Germany unconditionally surrendered to the Allies. Because of the pandemic, this is the first time since 2019 that full-scale celebrations have been able to take place across the country. There have been wreath-laying ceremonies, Thanksgiving services and street parties in the UK today. So to discuss the meaning of VE Day 77 years on, I'm joined by the historian David Aldroyd Bolt. David, thank you for joining me. Andrew, thanks very much. So, Obviously, during the pandemic, there could be no celebration. That was the 75th yep. anniversary, of course, a couple of years ago, and, and but now we have the opportunity to do so. Is this still important? I think it's hugely important to remember. Um, it's probably, for most Britons, the defining uh, aspect of the 20th century, that we stood alone between the fall of France and Operation Barbarossa, where uh, Germany invaded Russia, and then carried on throughout the, uh, the war with the Americans and then the, the Russians to defeat Nazism. Um, I think one of the aspects of it we should remember is that although it was a wonderful thing that we defeated Nazism, the unlooked for consequence was that we delivered Eastern Europe into 40 years of slavery under communism. So perhaps it's a time when we can more broadly look at what happened in Europe throughout the 20th century and think about our role in that and how we react to it now. So you see this as an opportunity to remind ourselves for educational purposes as much as anything else. Yes. But, but, but national pride, you feel, is part of that as well, you think? I think it is. You know, we have to recognise that we did an extraordinary thing in standing totally alone against uh, occupied Europe. Don't forget that Germany at, at this point... Uh, was in control of the whole of Europe, bar, of course, Portugal, uh, which was neutral, uh, and Spain, which uh, fr Franco managed to keep them out. Uh, otherwise, the Nazis were in control. And we, the little island off the west coast of Europe, managed for a year and a half to stand against this and to essentially keep Europe from becoming a fully fascistic continent. We should be very happy about that. But isn't it funny, though, because at the moment, with so many sort of social justice activists talking about Nazism and fascism and, and Antifa and the rise of those sorts of movements, you would think that this in particular, I mean, this was the death of the Reich, right? So this is surely the moment that they should be celebrating. And yet those same people, I think, are very mistrustful of uh, anything that they perceive to be overly jingoistic, say. Well, they'll still think that it has connotations of empire and colonialism, I suppose, because we were at the time the British Empire. Yes. Um, but that's just such a non-argument, really, isn't it? Come on. The real empire, the, the empire we defeated, was the Nazi empire that was trying to wipe out the Jews, was trying, would have continued and wiped out the Slavic people of Eastern Europe. And this was not something that we could ever come to any accommodation with. And I would ask those people who say we shouldn't celebrate VE Day, what would you celebrate? Mm. I know. What would you rather have happened at that time? So what do you make of this? Though? I mean, there have been a number of cases recently where prominent, uh, even historians, have said that they feel that Winston Churchill was a racist figure who ought to be cancelled. Mm. You know, there was even a conference at Cambridge, I think, with uh, Priyam Vardagopal talking about this idea uh, and, and talking about his uh, involvement with the Bengal famine, for instance, and saying any kind of celebratory event relating to Churchill is problematic. Do you have much truck with that? Uh, not really, no. I mean, Dr Gopal can't really be taken as a disinterested observer of this. She is a highly partial academic who has uh, an animus against, it seems, a, a great many historical figures, uh, purely because they happen to be white. Now, I would suggest that that's perhaps racist. Um, she would, I'm sure, say it wasn't just because they were white. Though, no, sure. she wouldn't, but a lot of what she's uh, written on Twitter, as far as I have seen, of course, uh, one must be a little careful with this, has for me, carried uh, tinges of racism about it. But it's not just, I mean, that's your opinion, but it's yes. not just her, of course. There are uh, many other people. There have been va uh, attempts at vandalism of the statue of Churchill yeah. in London, that kind well, of thing. But look, it's... this is just, uh, frankly, this is just aggravators trying to get a rise, isn't it? It's not really serious historical commentary to go and paint a mohawk on Churchill. It's actually rather amusing. I'm sure that he himself... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he himself would have said, you know, all power to you for having the, uh, the speech, the freedom of speech and action to do this. And why is that? Because we didn't let the Nazis win the Second World War. Yes. You know, so even though they may now decry him, even though they may say he was a racist, and Churchill did have some views which were entirely typical of a man who was born in the latter half of the 19th century. Yes. They're not the views of somebody who was born in 2002. Yeah, you know, absolutely. There's a century and a quarter <laughs> separating these people. Surprise, surprise. You know, yeah. Well, of course, you know, but context is far too, difficult, uh, far too difficult a thing for the woke mind to grasp. Do you think people are losing an appetite for these kind of uh, street celebrations? There have been some celebrations yeah. today and that kind of thing. But do you think that kind of thing is just... I mean, if you compare to the... Obviously, the, the actual VE Day, I mean, the, the, I think it was a million old people in, in central London. Yeah. I believe Queen Elizabeth, the young Queen Elizabeth, mingled with the crowd Princess and... Princess Elizabeth, Princess Margaret went into the crowds and uh, in, in front of the palace and it was... Yeah. They weren't separated, they were... They were, no, they were among them. 
Um, well, of course, we're not going to continue celebrating it forever. We, you know, we don't anymore celebrate Trafalgar Day. Mm. Uh, we don't anymore commemorate the Battle of Agincourt. We don't anymore uh, think of you know the, the relief of uh, Mafeking, all of which were at, at times through history uh, celebrated. There was a, even a verb to Mafeking, meaning to have a big party to celebrate this. And I think as as we go on and as that generation dies off, because there are you know, when I was a child, the First World War generation was dying, and, mm. and now there are very few who actually fought in the Second War. Um, you'd have to be well over 90 now yes. to, to have fought there. Uh, I think it will become more of an aspect of commemoration and of thought about our place in the world than it will a, a celebration. Although, you know, we really should still celebrate the fact that we stopped one of the most murderous tyrannies that the world has ever known. Yeah, um, I mean, that's not it's trivial. Not, it's, no, <laughs> it's, it's not the sort of thing that happens every, every generation. It's, yes, um, it's an extraordinary thing we managed to do, along, of course, with the help of the Americans, and then later on with Russian involvement. And and that's perhaps the aspect that's most uncomfortable for us to think about: that w without the Allies, uh, without sorry, um, uh, an al alliance between Russia and us, we would probably not have been able to stop the war quite so quickly. Mm. But by giving Russia that power, then, as I say, we handed over all of Eastern Europe to 45 years of of, of oppression and tyranny. Do you feel that a sense of history, and particularly the history of our country, is important in terms of a national identity? Well, of course it is. You can't, you can't have any concept of what it means to be English, to be British, Scottish, Welsh, Irish, without uh, a knowledge of that history, the reason how I, you came to be. But the reason I say that is because there are, uh, so many people are quite keen to either revise mm. what our history was or to eliminate certain uh, physical uh, remnants of it, I well, suppose. History is subject to constant revision. It should be. Um, you can't be intellectually lazy and say that there is one fixed history. And in fact, by constantly um, thinking about re-evaluating uh, our role in history and by going back to the documents of history and reading those with uh, you know, the light of new evidence, which is what we should do, but I fear too few people actually do, mm. instead of going to a document and asking, what does this show us? Instead of thinking about an event and asking, what does this tell us? They go with a pre-existing thesis that they mm. then try and prove through specious use of documents and, and events. But I think you have to understand your history to understand, even if you disagree with it, even if you dislike it immensely, even if you think that the British Empire was a, uh, a totally merciless, rapacious, dreadful uh, mercantile system that should never have existed, which I don't, but a lot of people do, you should still understand it in order to know how we got here and who we are. Well, David Aldroyd Bolt, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> now... Every week, we dedicate this part of the show to the world of social media. First up is a mum who has brought up her child to be well-versed in gender ideology, but is now seemingly baffled that her child doesn't understand basic grammar. Let's have a look. So, because pronouns, you know, those are all the pronouns, but you used they for those two sentences. Why did you use they? Because, because how am I supposed to... I don't know if it was a they, them, a he, or a she. You didn't feel like the name was a clue? No? Why not? <laughs> because you always say nothing is a boy thing and nothing is a girl thing. Nothing is a boy thing and nothing is a girl thing? Yeah. Yeah. So how do I grade this paper? I don't know. I should give it an A because it's what I taught, I, that's what I taught you about being non-binary? Yeah! <laughs> OK, so should a parent really be surprised that if she's taught her child that they, them, which are, of course, uh, plural pronouns, could be applied to individuals, that the child is now incredibly confused when it comes to learning about grammar? Yeah, I mean, it's breaking the conventions of, of grammar. And it's, <laughs> uh, I mean, well, this, this is a mother who's teaching it. Yes, so I, that's I, right. Expect this sort of behaviour from, uh, from uh, school teachers <laughs> rather than uh, parents. But, yeah, I mean, they, them, it confuses me. Like, it's impossible to refer to Sam Smith, the singer, as if you try and, and sort of maintain they, them as his pronouns, uh, as their pronouns, yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. It's like, a, like he's not a group of people. It's funny, isn't it? Because even the people who, who do support the use of gender neutral pronouns, they always slip up yeah. with him because they can't, they can't maintain impossible. it. They can't maintain it. And also, have you seen, sometimes the articles are written about Sam Smith and it's all they, them, they, them. I, I actually find it difficult. I don't know who they're talking about halfway through. This happens to me all the time. Or do you not have a problem with it? I don't have a problem with it because I would get it wrong anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, think, I think a lot of people's barriers to it are just the difficulty in having to unlearn stuff. 
And I, actually, I reckon my kids will be brought up be fine with it. Do you know what? It, and that, I'll just sound old because I'll get it wrong. That's not my difficulty at all. My difficulty is that I believe that language evolves continuously and things change all the time linguistically. Yeah. But when that is imposed by groups of elites, that's dangerous because there's a there's a very dodgy history of that, and I think that's the difference here is that they them as a singular pl pronoun mm. has simply not caught on. People just don't use it that way. Yeah. There's a, there's a few Unless sort of a business or a football team. There's an argument that they, those are both singular and plural. Right. Those but are that, the they them's that you know like so Arsenal they have had a good match. But that's because you are implicitly talking about many members of the team. Yes, exactly, but, yeah. but you know... The actual correct way is to say Arsenal, it has had a good... Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah, but Arsenal is a good team, but Arsenal yes. are a good team, both of those are valid. But that actually exposes the problem, doesn't it? Because I, I, that... Unless you don't like Arsenal, in which case none of them are valid. No. <laughs> but in that case, that exposes the issue, is that as far as Arsenal, you're talking about a team which is singular, yeah. and you're talking about the individual members which become plural, because there are many of them. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is the point. I mean, I, that, that would be my concern about this, Leo, is that, you know, uh, if, if, you know, one day we all nat the language naturally evolves and everyone uses they, them, as a singular, I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. The problem is that, that a very small group of people have decided we must all change our language to fit in with their ideological worldview. Yeah. That, to me, should be opposed on principle. Yeah, and using they, them pronouns makes sense to me when you're not sure of the gender of the Which we all use, exactly. To, which which is, is common. Uh, but when you know the gender of the person, when it's Sam Smith, I mean, come on. Like, yeah, we're, it's, it's... we're pretty, like, I mean, I know they wants to be called them, uh, <laughs> but they just... <laughs> Isn't. I'm sorry, Sam, but you're just not, like... Well, on. anyway, let's move on to the next, <laughs> next one. We've got a video here featuring Home Secretary Priti Patel. It's being disrupted here by activists at a local Conservative Party event. I actually just want to stop. Priti Patel, your racist policies are killing people. Your plans to send people seeking asylum to Rwanda are inhumane. They're inhumane and are going to ruin people's lives. Tough crowd. What do you think, Stephen? You've been heckled before. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's... I, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have laughed because obviously it's a serious subject for people on both sides, but it's the fact they had to subtitle out, 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 <laughs> out. <laughs> out. I'm pretty sure we knew what that was. Also, what I like as well is in order for those people to infiltrate that meeting, they dressed as they believe young Tories would dress at that event, and they were immaculate. <laughs> uh, all I can say is there was, there was a level of suit going on there that would get them pretty much any job, I would have thought. Well, um, but, no, I mean, yeah, it's... it's uh, the last thing they want is a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, you know what it's, it's uh, politica, political activism that is almost retro. I felt it was, uh, I felt it was quite honourable. Uh, that's turning up, I'm not happy with it, shout at them, get shouted out, thrown out. That's kind of how politics works, isn't it? Well, listen, I'm going to have to stop you there. I know Leo's got a lot to say about it, but listen, we've got to end the show, so thank you very much for joining us for Free Speech Nation. This was the week when the Labour Party became the centre of a beer and curry-related controversy. Another comedian was assaulted on stage, and the Taliban reminded us that they don't like women very much. Thank you to my panel, Leo Kirsten, and Stephen Grant, and to my guests, Helen Joyce, Tom Slater, Dr Tess Lowry, Neil Oliver and David Oldroy Bolt. And if you want to hear more from Matt Letissier, you can. That's on Free Speech Nation, the podcast. The full interview is live now, and you can access that on all major audio streaming services. And if you want to join us live in the studio, be part of our wonderful audience, you can do that as well. Just please go to www.siroaudiences.com. That's there on the screen at the moment. Please come along. We give you free drink. My audience now, they're drunk. They're loving it. <laughs> come along. Stay tuned for the brilliant Mark Dolan tonight. That's next. And don't forget that Headliners is on every night at 11 o'clock. That's the late night paper preview show where comedians talk you through the next day's top news stories. Thanks for watching Free Speech Nation. See you later. Looking ahead to tomorrow's weather and the UK is looking wet and windy in the northwest, drier but chillier to start in the southeast. Let's take a look at the details. Monday morning is going to be mostly fine in the southwest of England, with some decent bright periods, but there will be some high-level cloud around.
Meanwhile, in the southeast, there will be largely clear skies. It will be chilly first thing, but temperatures will quickly rise in the sunshine. In Wales, it will also be mostly fine, but some cloud here. Most of it will be high up, so it should still be bright. It's a similar picture across the Midlands and northwest England. A dry and bright start here, but winds are expected to pick up, meaning it will be more blustery than today. Northeast England will also be dry and mostly bright at first, with some thicker clouds starting to push in from the northwest and strengthening winds too. Rain is set to arrive here later. This rain will already be across much of Scotland first thing. The rain is going to be heaviest in the northwest of the country, with the strongest winds here too. Western Northern Ireland is looking similarly wet. Whilst it should be drier to start in the east, the rain is going to spread here later with winds picking up. So it will be a wet and windy morning in the southwest as rain spreads across, drier, sunnier and warmer in the southeast. And that's how the weather is shaping up during tomorrow morning. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. On tonight's